do it live quick. Okay. So I'm just waiting for it to literally say live, but I know it's recording for sure. Okay, now we're live. Alright, so this is March 9th, Daily Bread. Took me a little longer to get it set up. Um, yeah, I had to get through Satan's attacks. Of course, I leave church and I was in a great mood because it was a great, great lesson that, that Christian taught, Pastor Christian taught tonight. And I really liked the message and it really spoke to me and I was in a great place. And of course, Satan had to come and destroy that, obliterate it, blow it to a thousand pieces. So I had to regather myself first before I could do this. So the insight scripture for March 9th is Romans 12, 9 through 16. Uh, we're going to be reading Deuteronomy 8 through 10, and then the uh, uh, the and then Mark 11 verses 19 through 33. So, Father, as we continue in your word, I just want to first and foremost thank you for waking me up today. But, Father, I also want to thank you for that message tonight. The one scripture that he brought up was one that there were several scriptures he brought up tonight when he first started teaching that. I had actually covered in a teaching, that, not a teaching, but in a video that I did the other day that was, I think, one that was on Colossians that I had used um, the teaching from J.D. Farag from the Calvary Chapel in Hawaii. Yeah, there it was from the Daily Bread, but it was the one scripture. Oh gosh, I forgot what, which one it was now. My notes are like way over there and they take me forever to dig them out now, but that talks about my my words are on their lips but their hearts are far from me like that one and there's no testament scripture and then we just read it I, I know we just read it not too long ago and then you know he was he was talking about that and i don't know you just i i actually shared the the youtube version of the teaching um on my facebook and it was a great teaching it was a great teaching and i love the way he breaks it down verse by verse and everything he just makes it so interesting i just it's hard for me to take notes because I'm just like just drawn in and just absorbing every word he says. But yeah, um, it, Colossians is a great, great book um, that teaches us that if we have Jesus alone, that that's all we need. And not to be deceived to believe that there's anything else we have to do, that our works will not earn the righteousness that we need because our righteousness is his filthy rags but the righteousness that we have through the cross and him crucified and through Jesus and for what Jesus did for us is the righteousness that God sees when he looks at the blood on us from Jesus that Jesus shed on Calvary for us and then oh it was such a good teaching and I was in such a great place when we left there but yeah he wasted Satan wasted no time I didn't even get halfway home <laughs> before he started in but one of these days I'll learn to just not let him you know but it's really hard when you get it from two different ways anyways Paul's letter to the Roman churches can be divided into two parts doctrine chapters 1 through 11 and duty chapters 12 through 16 the apostle instructs believers in Jesus not to conform to the pattern of this world, but to live a transformed life that honors Christ. Romans 12, 9 through 21 reads like the snippets of isolated sayings that we find in the book of Proverbs. Just grab my Bible so you can what that says. What did I say? Oh. 
Romans 12. And, uh, I don't think actually he was referring to that scripture tonight. I swear, that's so weird. Romans 12. Here am I. Nine. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Plead to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. The Christian is to only bless and not pronounce judgment on others. Even our most strident enemies, we must leave judgment to the Lord. Yeah. 15. Rejoice with them who do rejoice, and weep with them who weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but con condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing you shall reap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. See how good God is? See how good he is? He knows I needed to hear that. But Paul is still talking about a renewed mind and a transformed life. The clearest demonstration of this is Christ-like love. Verses 9 and 10. Zealous service, 11 and 12, and generous giving, verse 13. He tells us how we're to relate to both believers and non-believers. In a world of hate and revenge, loving others, particularly enemies, is a key test of the reality of a renewed mind and a transformed life. And this is written by K.T. Sim. My son keeps walking past the room. I know he's wanting to ask me for some his meds for tomorrow so I'll just go ahead and give him to him now because he knows if he asks me right now I'll probably rip his head off so I'll just go ahead and give him to him so I don't have to rip his head off even though I do have other children that look just like him he's one of the reasons I'm upset Romans 12, 9 through 16 reads, Behave like a Christian. Let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. See, I struggle with this. I struggle with this hard when people treat me like dogs. You know what I mean? When people are, are mean, when they are... They are s s Oh, I just don't even want to go there. Not lacking in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And, and they're phonies, and they put on this fake persona in front of other people, and it just makes me want to vomit on the floor. Oh. Rejoice with those who rejoice. And it's so hard. Huh? It's so hard. And I try, I try to do this right here. I really do. I really do. But they just know the right things to do. And they take pleasure in doing it to upset me. They get sick pleasure out of it. And I don't understand that. 
kid. I don't understand. What I really don't understand is why I keep allowing them to do it. That's what I don't understand. Ugh. Boy. So these, this is how I try to get past it. Is I, I get it to learn to learn. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lacking in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope. Patient in tribulation. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. Given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And I had actually read the other five verses. I just realized that this is actually a reading, so I would not have read that out of the Bible. Well, then I realized that, realized that this is a reading. Oh, if I had paid attention. Oh, it's okay. Sharing excitement for Christ. For th the first time we met our neighbor Henry, he pulled a well-worn Bible bag he'd been carrying. Eyes sparkling, he asked if we'd like to discuss scripture. Hmm. That sounds like Deacon Danny from my old church. <laughs> he knows his word, I tell you what. We nodded and he flipped to some highlighted passages. He showed us a notebook full of his observations and said he'd also created a computer presentation full of other related information. Henry went on to tell us how he'd come from a difficult family situation and then, alone and at his worst, he accepted Jesus' death and resurrection as the foundation of his faith, Acts 4.12, which reads, come on, cheek, come on, cheek, cheek. there we go. Now this is an IV, but eh, what do you do? Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Amen. His life had changed as the Spirit helped him follow the Bible's principles. Although Henry had committed his life to God years ago, his enthusiasm was fresh and powerful. Henry's zeal inspired me, someone who'd walked with Jesus many years, to consider my spiritual passion. The Apostle Paul wrote, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. Yeah, that's basically what we just read. That seems like a tall order, unless I'm allowing Scripture to nurture the kind of attitudes that reflect an ongoing thankfulness for all that Jesus has done for me. Unlike the emotional highs and lows we experience in life, Zeal for Christ comes from an ever-expanding relationship with Him. The more we learn about Him, the more precious He becomes, and the more His goodness floods our souls and spills out into the world. And this was written by Jennifer Benson Schultz. How do you think Jesus feels when He sees that you're excited about Him? Oh, I can imagine. What's the relationship between thankfulness and zeal? Dear Jesus, please revive my excitement over knowing you. Oh, <laughs> he doesn't have to do that. I think that's a little obvious. Uh, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Romans 12, 11. Okay, Deuteronomy 8. Did I open these? I did not. Oh, 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 oh my gosh. I can't believe I'm so dumb. Okay. Well, isn't that just special? Hmm. I'll strangle that cat. I am so glad. He oh, no, don't start this. That's going to take too long. I'll do it this way. Close. Deuteronomy's open real quick. I thought I had already opened these. Talk on it. I thought I opened them before I left to go to church so they'd be ready to go. <sighs> Alright. Oh, you're just loud. 
boy, you better be quiet. I've heard enough complaining all the way home. I don't want to hear any more from him. Please, please, I'm begging you, Toby. Lay down and go to sleep. freeze to death in this house. So one time I I'll explore. Close. I'm afraid to just hit X and see if I'd have hit it again I'd probably work. Where my system trigger? Okay, now it's showing audio. Okay, as long as y'all can hear me. Oh, let's turn up like Cavus were. Oh, oh. Yeah, I would like to know what happened to my system tray, though. That is kind of weird. Let me go grab him and bring him in the room. dark and I'm not going to kill myself in the dark and why can't y'all see I can't see audio <sighs> what is going on here uh, where is my system tray <sighs> taskbar settings <sighs> gosh Get this. I don't know where my test. Well, it's showing, and now it's showing audio. I, so I guess, I guess y'all can hear me. Well, if not if you can't hear me. And see, the one viewer I had is now gone because I'm messing around trying to figure out whatever. I can't, I can't, I can't see if I have audio. And it's showing audio now, so as long as I have audio, whatever. All right, so you can see on my screen, so you can always just read it, I guess. So the when is the same, the characters are the same, and the where. Times like this, I wonder why I even bother doing this. Okay, so the outline, God's discipline, and provision for Israel in the wilderness, verses 1 through 10. Moses wanted Israel to remember how God humbled them in the wilderness, but through the process of humiliation, he provided for them and cared for them. He gave them food from heaven, manna, every day on their journey. He fed them with this heavenly bread to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And God also kept the sandals of the Israelites from wearing out during their wanderings. They were promised the land of rich blessing when their journey was complete. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a, a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. Uh, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of the, whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you, verses 7 through 10. A warning about complacency and pride, verses 11 through 20. And he, as he had previously, Moses warned Israelites not to forget God when they received their blessing. He knew they would be tempted to become complacent when they lived in their new homes and enjoyed the riches and comfort of Canaan. Moses knew how easy it was to forget God when life is easy. He also warned 
He also wanted to warn them about the potential of pride corrupting their hearts and memories. He told them to take care unless they start to believe their blessings were a result of their own strength. Moses did not want the Israelites to forget it was God who gave them freedom in Egypt, led them safely through the dangerous wilderness, gave them water in the desert, gave them food when they were hungry, and gave them victory over the armies of their enemies. If Israel forgot God, God promised to drive them out of Canaan like the nations who lived there before them. The application. Moses, okay, I'm going to go straight on this cat. Excuse me. I have to hear him downstairs complain one more time, I'm going to be strangling a lot of necks tonight, I swear. So sick of it. Worse than a woman. Oh! <sighs> Moses said to Israel, Beware lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this well. You shall remember the... Boy, you better lay it down. You better lay it down, Toby. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. The temptation to believe our money and possessions are a result of our own ingenuity is still powerful in the 21st century. This may be part of the reason why Jesus, in the model prayer, Luke 11, 1 4, tells His disciples to ask God for their daily bread. And for those that may not know, which I'm sure you do, but Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, give us this day our daily bread right um, no matter how rich we are we need to remember all our wealth comes from God and it is not guaranteed to be there tomorrow remembering to ask God every day for something to eat is a daily reminder of our dependence on him and a protection against crime okay thank God he's going to eat he's worrying me there He's like wandering around, thought he was going to looking for a place to go potty or something. He doesn't do that, but I, I ain't know what he's going to do. <sighs> Got to have him at that place at 7.30 to 8.30. I'm going to be there before 7.30 so I can be like first in line because it's a drive through and they come out to your car. And I get to do this by myself. Yay me. Deuteronomy 8. Remember the Lord your God. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these forty years. Now it's got me complaining. I just ruined my night. Satan, I hate you. Ah, I'm sorry, guys. I don't mean to be such a bummer, but it's, I really tried to get calmed down before I did this. For this reason right here. I was such a good one to do that. Oh, shut up, computer. No. Oh, now you're going to start giving me notifications when this is supposed to be off. Ah! How funny. Time to lay down. I lay it down. Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart. Lay down. Lay down. Whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the, of the Lord. What the heck was that sound? Toby, 
Yeah, you can get in the window, but don't start hollering. No. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs. See, they know I'm trying to do this video right now. They know this. Uh, that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. You know, when I would read this, I used to think that sounds like the U.S. That sounds like our country. Do you see how blessed we are? Amen? Yeah. In which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can get copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses, and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness, in which were fiery serpents, and scorpions, and thirsty land, where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you, and that he might test you, Al, to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day, would you lay down and put on me? There. And then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you, so you shall perish, because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. And if he thinks I'm going to keep this cat shut up in this room all night, he's out of his mind. He is out of his mind. There is no way. Because <laughs> Debbie has to get her sleep too. She has high blood pressure. And this dress is not good for it. At all. At all. I'm speaking of which, I guess I should probably take one. Boy, you better quit back. You better pray to everything that's holy. You didn't just do what I think you did. Boy, you're lucky. Oh, I'd beat you. Oh, y'all would hear him screaming then because I would beat him. Because once they start spraying, and even if you get them fixed, they are more than likely going to start spraying. I can't let them outside because of our neighbor. So I need to hurry and get them fixed. Should have already had that done. Thank God I found a place, though. Ugh. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. So Deuteronomy 9. Okay, so the wind. Okay, he's still giving his speech and, you know, catching them up and making sure they understand. So there'll be no questions asked, right? Uh, characters, we know who the Israelites are. We know who Moses is. Aaron sadly uh, has already died. He was the high, first high priest of Israel. He made the golden calf when Moses was on Mount Sinai. He claimed that he just put the golden fire and this calf just jumped out of it, but we know better. Toby, stop. I'll go get sister in a minute. Now, let's see what is today, Wednesday. Yeah, okay. Um. Okay, the where, and as far as I know, they're still in the place of Moab near Pisgah, right? Right, right over here. All right, you see, yeah. you see the map. Jesus rose. Okay, the outline. Israel reminded of their stubbornness and wickedness, verses 1 through 29. I think that is the outline. <laughs> uh, God was going to empower the Israelites to conquer the land of Canaan. even though their enemies were powerful people. But God did not want the Israelites to think he was giving them the land because of their personal righteousness. In fact, he told them that was not the case. The Israelites were going to be allowed to conquer the promised land because of the wickedness of the nations who lived there before them.
God intended to punish no claws, claws, claws. Ow! Get off of me! God intended to punish those nations for their evil. Dang it, Toby! What is wrong with you? And was going to use the Israelites to do it. The other reason God was giving Israel the Canaan land was because of the promises he made to their forefathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Lay down! Lay down! Lay down and stop it! Moses reminded the Israelites of two occasions when they rebelled against God. When the people made an idol, a golden calf, and worshipped it while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the law from God, Exodus 32. And also, that is why they have never, ever made a shafar out of a cow bullhorn, I mean, a bullhorn. Because they don't want to remind God of this right here. They've made shafars out of every other kind of animal horn but the bull. <laughs> When Israel abandoned faith in God and despaired at the negative report brought back by the ten spies who were sent to spy out Canaan in Numbers verse chapters 13 and 14, on both occasions Moses had to plead with the Lord not to destroy the Israelites. Mm -hmm. So the application is critics of the Bible love to present the Israelites' conquest of Canaan as a bloodthirsty imperialist march of violence sanctioned by God to steal land belonging to the innocent townspeople. But this chapter reveals the people of Canaan were not innocent. They were evil, and God intended on using the Israelites to punish them. God did this to several nations in the Old Testament, including the Israelites when they became corrupt later in their history. Where are you at now? Toby, quit walking around. I don't trust him. These types of mischaracterization characterizations are part of the reason we need to study these more obscure Old Testament books. Critics aren't shy Stop it. about abusing lesser known texts. Deuteronomy 9 Israel's rebellious rebellions reviewed. Hear O Israel you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before... I so feel so bad for him. He wants outside so bad. And after tomorrow, it won't matter. It will not matter if he goes outside because he'll be fixed. I feel really, really bad. <laughs> But we don't need any more cats. A people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakin, whom you know and of whom you heard it said. Who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land. But because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you. And that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God has not given you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb you provoked the Lord to wrath, so that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Lord made with you, then I stayed on the mountain forty days and forty nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Boy, then the Lord delivered to me two ta tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. Tell me, I can't keep the end here because you guys are going to have to use a litter pan. And I'm trying to finish this video so I can... Gosh!
Go use another pan before you pee on something. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people whom you brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. Then they have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded image. Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me, saying, I have seen this people, and indeed they are a stiff-necked people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God, had made for yourselves a molded calf, and he immediately goes down and starts yelling. <sighs> you had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. Then I took the two tablets and threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, forty days and forty nights. I either neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you committed to doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you, to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Then I took your sin, the calf which you had made, and burned it with fire and crushed it and ground it very small until it was as fine as dust. And I threw its dust into the brook that descended from the mountain. Let me go. Knock it. God, married to a woman. I don't even know where I was. Oh, until it was as fine as dust, and I threw his dust into the brook that descended from the mountain. Also at Tabera and Massa and Kibroth, Hataava, you provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, Go up. And possess the land which I have given you. Then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you did not believe him nor obey his voice. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I prostrated myself before the Lord. Forty days and forty nights I kept prostrating myself. Because I bet Moses was really skinny. Just saying. Because the Lord had said he would destroy you. Therefore I prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, no man, you're not coming to get on the computer yet, I'm still using it. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can lay on it when I'm done, nibbles. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not look on the stubbornness of this people, or on their wickedness or their sin, and don't you mess with Miss Citrus, she's laying there sleeping. Nibbles, go back down. If you're looking at her, you don't know. Well, she's gone. Where'd she go? Oh, good Lord. Now where's she at? You know what? I'm not going to even try to keep up with that little girl. I don't know where she went now. Since she's just gone now. Oh, I could have sworn I put Deuteronomy 10 on a, on a separate page. Oh, well, I don't care. <sighs> to the land which he promised them, and because he hated them, he has brought them out to kill them in your wilderness. Yet they are your people and your inheritance whom you brought out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. Okay, that's nine. Okay, and I honestly, I swear, I know I did. But that's so uh, that irritates that bugs me. I kind of, uh, yeah, this kind of, yeah, so why is that? That's so weird. Huh. Well, because that's going to bug me. Let me just put it on its own page. All right. 
Yes, I'm a perfectionist. Alright. Deuteronomy 10. And I thought this was right good. <sighs> okay, so when we know the characters. The characters, as soon as it spells. I don't know where she went. Okay, she went there two seconds ago. Israelites, Moses, Aaron, and Eleazar. Eleazar is Aaron's son and the second high priest over Israel, which we already knew that. Okay. The where? They're still in the same place. Mount Sinai, also known as Mount Horeb, is mentioned in Deuteronomy 9 and 10. Moses met with God on Sinai and wrote down God's laws for the people approximately 40 years before the words in Deuteronomy were spoken. All right. So the outline, okay, new tablets for the Ten Commandments, verses 1 through 5. In chapter 9, Moses recounted the Israelites' disobedience to God when they made an idol, a, golden, a gold calf at Mount Sinai, or Horeb. Moses was so angry when he saw the calf that he threw the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written on the ground and broke them. Moses opens chapter 10 by reminding the people how he and God made two ta new tablets and rewrote the law after the golden calf was destroyed. And what is that smell? Oh my God. Oh. Moses opens chapter 10 by reminding the people how he and God made two new tablets. I already read that, read that. New high priest after the death of Aaron, verses 6 through 9. Oh, I, got, I have to bust it. I gotta brace up, man. I can't handle that. That's disgusting. Ugh. God's mercy was shown when he gave the people, uh, a new copy of the Ten Commandments, and it was shown again when he gave the people a new high priest after the death of Aaron. Aaron died while the Israelites were in the wilderness, and God appointed his son, Eleazar, to take his place. Moses pleads, oh, sirens. <laughs> Moses pleads for the people, verses 10 and 11. Moses also reminded the people how he pled with God on Sinai not to destroy them after they repeatedly sinned following their departure from Egypt. Moses was recounting all these events to prove the point he made in the last chapter that the Israelites were not going to inherit Canaan because of their righteousness but because of God's mercy. Not going to inherit because of the righteousness but because of God's mercy. Not because of anything they did, in other words. Um, Moses calls Israel to faithfulness. And that's funny. That, that's awesome that he's talking about this because that kind of goes hand in hand with what Pastor Christian was talking about in the teaching tonight in Colossians 2. Uh, he picked up in verse 16 to the end of chapter 2, and it was talking about how our righteousness is as filthy rags, right? But it's only through the blood of the cross, Jesus' blood on us, that makes us righteous. I love how this is just going hand in hand with what he taught tonight. This is too cool. God, you're awesome. Okay, so uh, Moses I'm not getting a headache. Moses calls Israel to faithfulness. Verses 12 through 22. Moses said, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And what is that? 6-4? Uh, uh, listen, O Israel, the Lord is God. The Lord is one. Oh, gosh, can I really? I, I know how to say it in Hebrew, but for some reason I'm just forgetting it in English. Okay, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. But, uh, let's see, uh, Deuteronomy 6. What is wrong with my brain? I'm tired, that's right. I'm stressed. Now I'm getting a headache. Um, Debbie, you know it's after numbers. What are you doing? I can't see for one. God, I 
just like to go somewhere where nobody's around and just scream. Just scream. Just get it all out. Six, four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Yes. Amen. Shema. Prayer. Yes. Anyways. And that, which I am commanding you today for your good. Verses 12 and 13. God wanted the people to circumcise their hearts. They were all physically circumcised. All descendants of Abraham were as a sign of God's covenant with them. Genesis 17 chapter, uh, verse 10. But God wanted his covenant to have more than just a physical external effect on the person. He wanted the people of Israel to appreciate his covenant to the point of it changing them internally in their hearts. Moses concluded this chapter extolling God as the God of gods and Lord of lords and called on the Israelites to appreciate all he had done for them and their forefathers. The application? Remember the chapter divisions in our modern Bibles weren't added by the original authors and sometimes they can interrupt the flow of thought and be detrimental to our comprehension. I had a difficult time understanding why Moses started this chapter talking about the tablets for the Ten Commandments and Eleazar taking his father's role as high priest until I connected those thoughts back to the point Moses was making in the last chapter. Our organization of the Bible into chapters and verses is very helpful, but remember it isn't part of the original writing. Occasionally, you'll run across a poorly placed chapter break that splits a thought in half. You can buy Bibles that remove chapter and verse divisions, and I think they're handy for reading the Bible as it was intended to be read. Right, the Bible used to be just one, one thing. Mm, you're right, and it wasn't until years later that it was broken up. Yeah, exactly. So, the second pair of tablets. At that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain, mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord has spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now the children of Israel journeyed from the wells of Bnei Jaakon to Mozera, where Aaron died and where he was buried, and Eleazar his son ministered as priest in his steep. From there they journeyed to Good Goda, Good Goda, I think, and from Good Goda to uh, Jotbatha, a land of rivers of water. At that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister to him and to bless in his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion nor inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. As at the first time I stayed in the mountain forty days and forty nights, the Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. Then the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. The essence of the law. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him? to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, 
who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt with seventy persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven in multitude. Amen. Indeed, indeed, he has. Okay, and then Mark 11. Why are you opening over here? Get over there. Every time I say that, get over here, I think of that video game my kids played years ago. It was some disgusting game. They'd be like, get over here, and they'd snatch the person, and it would just be his skull and his spinal cord. It was terrible. Terrible game. I can't remember the name of that sick, sick game when my kids' boys were little. Oh. That was back before I was going to church regularly like I should. I was still in the world, so I didn't know any better. But that was a terrible game. All right, so yeah, I did have this on the right page, so I'm not sure what happened here. How dare you change it? Okay, uh, where were we picking up on verse 19? Yeah, so maybe it was on the right page. Uh, I think it was. I found it. Okay, what hurt? So I think I read verse 20. Okay, there's 19. Okay, and then I read all this stuff and all this. And I'm remembering all this. That's right, because I read 19. So, yeah, because I remember this. Where the Jewish leaders are, hey, man, it's really warm in here. Oh, is it just me? Yeah, just okay. Let me just second It's probably my blood pressure, really. Okay. Anyway, sorry about that. I had to check on the baby girl. <sighs> she 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 doesn't mouth breathe, but she's still drooling. I don't I don't know what's going on with her. I I may have to take her to the humane society and tell them, look, she is astray, and I can't I can't get her fixed, and I don't want her to die. I don't know what's wrong with her, and I don't have $500 to get x-rays, but she's not getting better. 
even worse. Even on antibiotics and all this. I'm just worried the death's going to die. She won't eat. She drinks water, sort of. That's it. Okay, anyway, so. Um, we had reiterated on this. 11, uh, 12, 13, and 14. Talking about, you know, he, when he, the next day when he came from Beth and he was hungry, he saw the tree. And there wasn't any of the little premature figs on it, you know, that come out in the spring. That would tell them that it was going to produce figs in the in June when it's supposed to, right? And so he said to it, "May no one ever eat fruit eat fruit from you again." And the disciples heard it. Now he was there's a lot of debate on what he meant by this, I and mean, it wasn't meaning the tree. So verses 20 through 25, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, pardon me, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. If you were like me, this text probably left you a little confused. Confused now, because I've said it this before. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Did Jesus regularly go around murdering trees? Cracks me up the way he puts that. No. He used the fig tree as a parable to teach his apostles important lessons. In Matthew's text, we're told Jesus approaches the tree after seeing its leaves but doesn't find any fruit. Mark chapter 11 includes a confusing additional line, for it was not the season for figs. So Jesus went looking for figs when it wasn't fig season. Got mad and cursed it? Seems a bit strange, right? To understand this passage, we need to put our botany hat on for a few minutes and dig into fig tree science. This is where I learned about the little premature figs. Here you go. You ready? Deep breath. The following information comes from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Fig trees are cultivated all over the Holy Land, especially in the mountain regions. Fig trees are usually of medium height, 10 or 15 feet, for full-grown trees yet individual specimens sometimes attain as much as 25 feet. In Palestine and other warm climates, the fig yields two crops annually, an earlier one, ripe about June, growing from the old wood, and a second, more important one, ripe about August, which grows upon the new wood. By December, okay, I had the months wrong, but uh, whatever. Um, um, grows upon new wood. By December, fig trees in the mountainous regions of Palestine have shed all their leaves and they remain bare until about the end of March. When they commence putting forth their tender leaf buds, Matthew 24, 32, Mark 13, 28, and verse 32, and Luke 21, 29 through 33, and at the same time, if the leaf axles appear the tiny figs, the early figs, these tiny figs develop along with the leaves up to a certain point, to about the size of a small cherry and then the great majority of them fall to the ground, carried down with every gust of wind. These immature figs are known to the Thalahim, farmer or agricultural worker in Palestine, as Taksh. Taksh. I misspelled it earlier, I think. By whom they are eaten as they fall. They may even sometimes be seen exposed for sale in the markets in Jerusalem. In the case of many trees, the whole of this first crop may thus abort, so that by May no figs at all are to be found on the tree. But with the best varieties of fig trees, a certain proportion of the early crop of figs remain on the tree. And this fruit reaches ripe perfection about June. Such fruit is known as, in Arabic as defer, or early figs, and in Hebrew as bikhara, the first ripe. Isaiah 28.4, Jeremiah 24.2, or Hosea 9.10. They are now, as of old, esteemed for the delicate flavor, Micah 7.1, etc. The miracle of our Lord 
uh, Matthew 21, 18 through 20, Mark 11, 12 and 13, uh, 10 and 21. That's kind of weird the way he put that. Okay, anyway. Which occurred in the Passover season, about April, will be understood as far as the natural phenomena are concerned by the account given above of the fruiting of the fig tree, as repeatedly observant by the present writer in the neighborhood of Jerusalem. When the young leaves are newly appearing, in April, every fig tree which is going to bear fruit at all will have some talks, immature figs upon it, even though the time of figs, Mark 11, 13, the King James Version, an example of ordinary edible figs, either early or late crop, was not yet. This tox is not only eaten today, but it is sure evidence, even when it falls, that the tree bearing is, it, it is not, that the tree bearing, it is not barren. In light of all this, Jesus approached the fig tree, probably expecting some of these delicious early figs. The foliage on the tree suggested he would find something. When he found nothing, it was an indication the tree wasn't going to bear fruit during the June harvest. His condemnation of the tree is based off what his findings tell him about the tree in the future. The tree looked good from a distance, but upon closer inspection, it was revealed to be fruitless. Kind of like the Pharisees of that time and the Sadducees. <laughs> what Jesus might be teaching his apostles with this tree, I think there are at least two things. First, there's still the obvious lesson as explained by Jesus. Jesus curses the tree to show the power of prayer in God's creation. Yeah. Prayer, prayed, and faith is immensely powerful because we are petitioning the God who has the power to move his creation as he desires. Second, Jesus is reiterating the point he's made in the past about judgment on the fruitless. The fruitlessness of the Pharisees, scribes, and Sadducees has already been well established. They, like the full leaf fig tree, looked good from a distance, but were ultimately fruitless. Jesus will condemn them even more strongly in the upcoming chapters. But Jesus may also be alluding to the fruitlessness of the common Jews. They had all gathered in the Jerusalem in Jerusalem to practice their religious devotions, but what were those worth considering? They were going to turn around and kill the Son of God in a few days. Your words are on my lip, on your lips. My words are on your lips, but your hearts are far from me. 24 and 25. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. So, does verse 24 mean I can pray for a new 10-bedroom house and God is going to deliver? I think we all know from past experience that that isn't true. Implied here is our prayers in alignment with the will of God. If our prayers in alignment with the will of God, no matter how great the request, whoops, God has the power to give it to us. While talking about prayer, Jesus brings another important point into the discussion, the issue of forgiveness. If you remember the model prayer in Matthew 6, You'll remember Jesus taught his disciples to pray about forgiveness. Matthew 6, 12 says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Mary's in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The, the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. But how can we say, uh, uh, actually, wait. Um, when, we, uh, when we come to God with a request, we must be ready to forgive those who have sinned against us. When you think about it, the only reason we have access to God through prayer is because of the forgiveness we have in Christ which ought to be something we cherish and appreciate. But how can we say we cherish and appreciate being forgiven by God if we aren't willing to forgive others for personal offenses? If we knew how much forgiveness we've received, extending forgiveness to someone else would be the easiest thing in the world. Amen. 27 through 30. And they came again to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? 
Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism, the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Then why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus enters the temple and was confronted by the Jewish authorities. The chief priests, scribes, and elders wanted to question him. They asked him who gave him authority to overturn the market tables and teach a new law. Was this an honest question? It wasn't. Are you surprised? In order to expose their dishonesty, Jesus commits to answering your question if they can provide an answer to his first. The baptism of John, where did it come from? From heaven or from man? Essentially, he was asking if John made up his teaching or if he was a prophet with a message from God. The Pharisees discussed it amongst themselves and found out they were in a bind. They couldn't say John made it up because it would put them out of favor with the common people. The common people believed John was a prophet. They couldn't say it was from God because they had rejected John. If they admitted it was from God, Jesus would ask them why didn't why they didn't heed John's words. Not to mention they would have to accept Jesus as the Christ because John confirmed his identity as such. They were stuck. Like any good politician, they dodged the question. They responded, we do not know. Their dishonesty had been exposed and because of their inability to answer Jesus' question, Jesus does not answer theirs. The application, Jesus spoke boldly about the nature of God, right versus wrong, and truth versus error. His bold speech led to his physical death. The Pharisees, scribes, chief priests, Sadducees, and elders refused to take a stand on controversial issues. Their cowardice and silence preserved their safety and reputation with the people. But at the end of time, the script will be flipped. Those who spoke boldly for God will be preserved in God's love for eternity. Those who remain silent to preserve their reputation with other people will experience spiritual death. Hmm. And I guess that was the end of that. There's a couple of links here. I'm not sure what this Julius Caesar horse thing is about. <laughs> oh. Hmm. And he was talking about the differences between, uh, you know, like when Jesus rode in on the donkey, whereas Caesar rode in on a horse or whatever. I don't really care about what Jerry Caesar did. I don't care about Jesus. Toby, you better pray you just peed in the litter pan and didn't cover it because I smell unneutered male pee really strong. You better pray, boy. You better start praying to your cat god. You heard it. Go away from me. You nasty. Oh. I don't care what anyone says. Cat farts are way worse than dog farts ever thought of being. They're disgusting. Oh. Gross. And gross. I'm going to strangle this cat. Okay, so I put the links underneath the footnotes in the description. But that's the end of this video. It's 11.15. I've got to get up early to take him to... And I've got to find this place, so... Yeah. I'm going to take him to go get fixed tomorrow. Yay. Um, so I hope y'all have a blessed night. And eventually I will get these caught up. <laughs> I will. I'll probably spend about 30 minutes at least getting the things set up for tomorrow. So I can just start knocking them out. So for now I hope you have a blessed night. And I will see you tomorrow.